All right. So in the book of Luke, even though I didn't have a specific um, verse to look at, we'll be, we'll be obviously looking at some, some uh, verses to support the thesis this morning. But I kept seeing these um, times of doubt, and I kept seeing these um, misidentification of Jesus, and there were so many of them. Uh, we saw the mystery of parables. We saw where Jesus would heal and then tell them not to go and tell anybody. We talked about that as the, the messianic uh, secret. Uh, John the Baptist sent some folks to, to ask Jesus who he, if he was indeed the Messiah. Herod uh, asking to see Jesus because he had heard so many different things about him. Um, and there were just so much doubt about who Jesus was, and we still have much doubt about Jesus was. And so I want to talk about the difference between the mysteries involved in our faith and darkness, because there's a difference. We have to understand that there are things we simply will not understand in the course of our belief. Um, we don't know what happened between age 2 and age 12 in the life of Jesus, or between age 12 and age about 30 in the life of Jesus. Um, we don't know why Jesus spoke in uh, parables. We don't know why sometimes he didn't heal everybody, and sometimes he, he, he uh, you know, there was no formula. So there are lots of questions to be asked. One of the conclusions that some theologians wrongly make, and I'm going to proclaim what to me is clearly truth today. Um, some theologians like to say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God, and so that was stuck into there and interpreted in there later, and that is clearly wrong. But I want you to think about some of the prevailing philosophies and religions of uh, today, and as I mentioned in the baptistry, growing up in the Bible Belt, nobody fussed at me for being a believer. They might have been skeptical or wanted to know why I did this or didn't do that, um, but I never got called a hater or, or uh, uh, anything like that. Uh, and today, you will be. Um, and the, if you look at the polls and the number of people who do not claim any a church affiliation who do not engage in church attendance. If you look at the number of people who claim atheists, uh, atheism or no belief at all, rapidly expanding. So we're moving into, we are in the midst of an age of, an, of not just a non-Christian culture, but an anti-Christian culture. Mm -hmm. So the conversations that I was trained to have in terms of personal witnessing and evangelism are not necessarily useful tools to a culture of non-believers and skeptics. Mm -hmm. Because um, in the Bible Belt, and for most of my childhood and adult life, if you wanted to talk about Jesus, there was a base of knowledge that everybody had. Now, they might have been wrong, or they might have been a little different, uh, but, but everybody kind of knew. Uh, and, and as I've said before, if somebody said, well, what do you believe? I said, well, I go to such and such a church. And that would answer their question because they knew uh, what the Baptist church basically was. I mean, they might have thought that we rolled in the aisles and handled snakes, but um, there, was a, there was a foundational belief in the uh, value of Scripture, even if not the authority of Scripture, but the value of Scripture and the uh, value of, of Christian ethics and morality. Um, I remember a, a friend of ours, a pastor friend, um, that uh, uh, there was another church member, this was back when we lived here 20 something years ago, and she was involved in kind of a controversial issue in her neighborhood, it was Navajo over the water uh, system, something like that. And so this, uh, this pastor friend uh, wrote a letter to the editor defending her, and in that said she's a fine Christian woman. Now, he also was from the Bible Belt, been in the ministry for, for years. Um, but I was talking to somebody who lived out there, 
And he said, what does that mean, fine Christian woman? That doesn't mean anything. And it really doesn't anymore. Even people who identify as Christian, I was talking online to a, a, a friend of mine who's um, inquiring about uh, beliefs, and um, somebody had told him, well, I believe in, uh, in God, and then later he saw a uh, pentagram <laughs> necklace, and she said, yeah, uh, Lucifer is my God. Uh, and there you have probably had these conversations with Christians. I heard of one the other day. Yeah, I'm a Christian, but I think there are lots of ways uh, to get to heaven. Mm -hmm. You know, it, that's offensive to say that there's only one way. But that's what this book teaches, and I will hopefully uh, give some additional evidence for the authority and veracity and truthfulness of that. Ricky Gervais, you some of some of you have heard of. He's a, uh, uh, a comic, uh, does The Office over in Britain, uh, did and, and he, he got fame that way. And he's he's famously an, an atheist, and he says. You're an atheist for all the thousands of gods that exist in the world except for one. I just believe in one less god than you do. There's one god. Well, let's talk about how logically that makes sense. First of all, let's just look at how God has revealed himself um, to us. And so we can kind of maybe use this as a conversation uh, supplement or a conversation starter with people who are non-believers. Let me just repeat this. You cannot assume that a person understands or correctly understands where you're coming from. You have to, when you're sharing your faith, you have to do that with the assumption that you have landed in a country that has never heard of Jesus and does not know anything about the Bible because we are just about that spiritually, theologically, biblically ignorant in our country today, right? Now, let me tell you who I blame for that. Do you remember who I've said I blame for that? America's churches because we have become more interested in programs and entertainment and gathering audiences and being so seeker friendly that we don't want to speak any truth that might offend somebody and we have a whole lost generation or two who know very little about scripture if you look at the number of active uh, members of youth groups and survey them five and ten years later you'll find that most of them have given up on an, any active practice of their faith now, I've been through a lot of youth programs. I've worked with a lot of youth directors. I've been in charge of some various programs. I'm, I'm not a, youth, a good youth director because I'm, just, I'm no fun. <laughs> <laughs> but we have had, again, a generation or two of youth programs that are designed around a brief devotional pizza and party. Yeah. Folks, that's fun for the moment. When you're 22 years old in the midst of a godless college environment, it doesn't do anything for you. Nothing. You might as well have been in the 4-H or any other good organization. So that's why I urge and urge and urge that you read your Bible on a regular basis. One of the reasons that I believe that this church has grown in the way that it has from a handful of people to this attendance is because we use this as our text and guide. That's right. mm -hmm. And it's not just because it's coming out of the pulpit, although I want you to hold me accountable for being scripturally based in my messages, but it's because you guys are reading scripture and you're full of the word. And when I say something, you can measure it against scripture because you know scripture. And if you're not engaged in regular Bible study, please do that on your own. Again, devotion books are fine. They're not the Bible. Bible study groups are fine. It's not the Bible. You must take personal discipleship seriously for reading your Bible. Is there any question about my stand on that? <laughs> now, fortunately, 
because I have to do this every Sunday, I am forced to read the Bible. And I'll, and I'll be very frank with you, I'm not sure how disciplined I would be. Because I'm kind of a crisis uh, motivated, uh, deadline motivated kind of a guy. Uh, so it has been a struggle in um, the last almost 60 years of, of being a, a Christ follower to engage in that. So I know it's a challenge, but um, it really must be done. How does God reveal himself? Paul says this, for his invisible attributes, that is his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen since the creation of the world being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. Well, don't you wish God would reveal himself? Have you seen the Spanish peaks? Have you seen the blue sky? Have you seen the wildlife? Have you seen the intricacy of tiny insects and the, the interest, intricacy of, of cells and DNA? You've probably not seen that, but you've seen evidence of it. <laughs> it there, there, is, there is no cogent, logical, sensible argument against an active, sentient creator. All right? So, and I'm not gonna argue with that, that with anybody. The, 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 some of the people that say, no, that doesn't actually mean they're a creator, that's, where, where, where did it start? Yeah. Well, then they say, where did God start? I don't know, but that doesn't answer the question either. <laughs> and you know what the answer is? Even amongst some in the scientific community who are non-believers, aliens. <laughs> Seriously. Yes. Seriously. Yeah. How did they get there? Oh, what's a big discussion. <laughs> it, it just, what that is, is a person who does, who looks in the very face of God's evidence and says, I don't want to have anything to do with you. And you know what? If you seek him, you'll find him. Right. If you deny him, he'll deny you. Amen. So, well, that, that's, that's one God. What if there's other gods out there? Again, logically... It only makes sense that there are other gods if they are inventions of human beings. Mm -hmm. The invention of other gods and other idols is an evidence that there is a God-shaped hole in us that we desire so sincerely to fill that if we don't know the truth, we'll make up a truth. Amen. And we make idols. Yeah. Yeah. And a religion can be an idol, whether it's under the umbrella of Christianity or something we just make up. You know, AA was predicated as a Christian program, and uh, now in those steps you'll see uh, that there is a spiritual component and a higher power uh, that used to be explicitly Christian, and now to have a broader appeal, if you want the doorknob to be your higher power, then you can do that. Um, and and you know, I'm a fan of AA and NA. They've, they've had tremendous success over the years. But again, don't, don't forget their uh, origins yes. as a Christian program. Well, so it, it really makes sense. It makes logical sense. One could argue, and I don't think that you should engage in theological arguments. It gets you nowhere. Um, but I think you, you, could, you could posit that there is one creator God because multiple gods doesn't make as much sense as one God, particularly when you think about the way that God has revealed himself and desires for us to have fellowship and the language of scripture, which will emphasize why we trust scripture, is very much one God. And um, if we do in fact have this creator God who has spoken to us, you know what? I think if there were other gods, he would get rid of them. <laughs> There's no need for any competing gods out there. It doesn't make sense. And again, this is under a doctrine called general revelation, if you want to look this up. That, that's, it's, a, it's a thing. The heavens, this is in Psalms, the heavens declare... The heavens declare the glory of God, and the expanse proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour out speech. Night after night, they communicate knowledge. Uh, the, the world actively engages our mind and our spirits. Now, when you see people that worship nature, or talk about the universe, or 
um, believe in, in pantheism, that, that, that there's God in everything, and certainly God is in everything, but not everything is God. Um, then we've gotten that communication garbled because it speaks of a creator. Now, we talk about general revelation, but we also talk about spe special revelation, and that's in two categories. Scripture is one, and Jesus is another. So let's look at this. All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. The Bible is, when we say, how do we know the Bible is true? One way, out of many ways, one way to say the Bible is true is that the Bible internally validates itself and speaks of its own truth. Now, if that were the only thing, we could argue that that's a tautology, a circular reasoning, doesn't, you know, I'm true because I say I'm true. Well, how do I know you're true? Well, I'm true. <laughs> yeah. But when we look at, and I won't go through the whole uh, list of things, when we look at the number of ancient manuscripts, when we look at the measuring modern translations compared to the ancient manuscripts, when we look at the contemporary writing where people were still alive when the Gospels were written, that knew Jesus and had witnessed these things, all of this is a tremendous amount of evidence about the truthfulness and the veracity of our scripture. And those who are engaged, believers or not, in studying ancient documents and archaeology will tell you, if they're honest, they will tell you there is more evidence for the accuracy of this book than any other ancient record by far. So we trust in Scripture. It was given to us as one of the ways that God reveals to us. This and these 66 books, um, written over a period of 6,000 years by many, many different writers, but they all, as we have emphasized, I think, in this church from this pulpit, it's all one story over the centuries and over the span of personalities and, and epics. It's, it is miraculous. This book is miraculous. Yeah. Now you say, well, how would, why is your Holy Scripture better than this Holy Scripture, that Holy Scripture? You can tell them there are reasons why. Has anybody read the, um, no, I can't even remember the name of the book now. Um, is Atheism Dead? Um, it, it, it's a good one. I've got a copy of my truck I'm working on. But it gives you it's good evidence of, of uh, the truth of Scripture. It talks about a lot of archaeological discoveries, many of which have happened just in the last 100 or 200 years, um, that have validated Scripture. There are also those who say, Jesus, as I said before, Jesus never said that he was God. Now, we don't see the words, I am God. But it is very clear that not only Jesus thought he was, uh, knew that he was God, his disciples knew that he was God, accepted that he was God, and that the skeptics, the Pharisees and Sadducees, hated him for saying that he was God. Mm -hmm. So if somebody says, and this was some, uh, a theologian, uh, a German theologian, that came up with this, oh, oh, we, we've changed the scriptures and we had to realign our beliefs because Jesus never said he was God. No, I and the Father are one. Now I know somebody who would say, oh, that means, you know, like you and I are one, or we're one in the spirit. No, uh -huh. he was talking about an absolute total identity with the Father. His Jewish opponents, this is all scripture, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. We are not stoning you for any good work. Because Jesus said, why are you stoning me? Because I heal people? They said, no. They replied, but for blasphemy because you, a mere man, claim to be God. So his audience recognized this statement as a claim of Christ to be God. And you remember also in Scripture, Jesus is saying, before Abraham, I am. That is a significant statement, culturally, historically, and linguistically, meaning I am God. And we can go to uh, John and, and many other passages uh, that talk about Jesus being 
Yeah, now this is, uh, this is a good example of a bad PowerPoint, but I'll just read this out to Colossians. <laughs> he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And think about this, not, not, not just uh, Paul describing who Jesus is, but in the con, uh, context of understanding the special revelation that God has given us, he has given us Christ incarnate, himself incarnate, so that we can know Jesus so that we can know God. If you want to know God, then you must know Jesus. God the Father revealed himself throughout history in the Old Testament, promising uh, the incarnate Messiah, and then the New Testament, the new promise, the new contract, explains the purpose of Jesus. So if to know Jesus is to know God. If we want to know God, we must know Jesus. I don't know about you, but I always have a little bit of trouble and hesitancy saying Jesus. I like Christ better. It's kind of crisp and it rolls off the tongue a little bit better. That's right. But Christ means king. And you hear some old preachers talk about Jesus, the Christ. That's actually very accurate. Somebody actually asked me this question. Is Jesus' middle name Hitler? Because she had always heard Jesus H. Christ. Oh. I'm telling you, we're not... We're not talking about unbelievers who should know better. We're talking about people who are desperately, darkly <coughs> ignorant of who Jesus is. So that was an interesting conversation. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth. So he was creator, the visible and the invisible, meaning all of these mysteries that we do not, cannot understand on this side of the veil, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. So he's not just something in our minds. He is active in the world. He's active in politics. That's right. That's right. Is, he, is, is God aware of who won the 2020 election? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, he is. <laughs> all things have been, uh, some of us may disagree about that. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. That, my friends, is the gospel. Yeah. When we're talking about Jesus, this, this encapsulates his work. And when I say, I urge you to accept the Lordship of Christ in your life. Now, other people say, make him your personal Savior, submit to him, come to him. All those things are fine. I like uh, accept the Lordship over your life, first of all, because you will someday. You'll be on your knees in the life to come. And you will bow your knee and you will confess. But right now, to confess him as Lord says, yes. I believe that he has all power. He was my creator. He is present with me. And if you think that you can escape his uh, blessing, you're wrong because God has provided this common grace to us and he will allow you to use your own free will to live in disobedience to him and he gives you the breath and the pulse and the energy to curse him and reject him. Because he's that gracious. But this is what I'm asking you to submit to. This, this is the gospel. So, there are those, we, we, we accept mystery. But there are others who say, oh, things are mysterious, you can't know God. Uh, but, but they're not living in mystery like the believer is. They're living in darkness. They've created their, their own God. They, they are traveling the wrong path. They are rebelling. A passage out of Luke, your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eyes are healthy, your whole body is also full of light. Get the metaphor, so your spirit. But when they are unhealthy, your body is also full of darkness. See to it then that the light within you is not darkness. Get rid of your Ouija boards. 
get rid of your lackadaisical uh, uh, attitude towards uh, being involved in, in fellow believers' lives and in reading the scripture. All of that's darkness. All of that's darkness. Be filled with light. This is the message we've heard from him and declare to you. God is light in him. There is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus. His son purifies us from all sin. Now, John goes ahead and says, if we say that we don't sin, we're, we're also liars. And, and so this, this doesn't mean that if you're backslidden or, or if you're hypocritical or if you do some things that are not consistent with what they think of as Christian life, doesn't mean you're losing your salvation. But if you are saved, live like you are saved. Because if you don't, you're not living in the light. You think you can live in the shadows and toy with darkness. And I would say that in a room of this many people, there are some of us toying with darkness while we're trying to live in the light. And this is a caution to us. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If you are in darkness today, you can flip on that light switch. Accept the Lordship of Christ who created you, loves you, and wants to live with you eternally, eternally. Or you can continue to walk in darkness to deny Him, to seek out those things that are momentarily pleasant or that avoid the pains of living as a Christian in an unchristian world. That is absolutely your choice. But if you seek Him and ask Him, you'll find Him. And I would just beg you with every ounce of my energy and soul and desire and mind to accept who Jesus is and you will live in the light of his truth. There is no better way to live.